And right now we have Brother Enoch to come sing for us. cannot describe its beauty as upon the stem it grows matchless in its glory a tender little rose when its petals are broken greatest beauty it shows almost sweeter as the fragrance of heaven's sweet rose the most beautiful rose was broken one day nailed to a tree on a hill far away forsaken by his friends bruised by his foes how sweet is the fragrance of heaven's sweet rose then they lay this broken rose in a borrowed tomb but on the that rose again did bloom now to the highest heaven down to the deepest hell the fragrance of heaven's rose continually dwells the most beautiful rose was broken one day Nailed to a tree on a hill far away Forsaken by his friends Bruised by his foes How sweet is the fragrance of heaven's sweet rose How sweet is the fragrance of heaven's sweet rose. Thank you, Pastor. And I'm going to say something, and uh, don't take this as a joke. Every time you go to preach, you should sing that before you preach. Amen. I'll tell you what. That'll guarantee... He gets a good listening audience and a lot of respect. Amen? Well, listen. I was told by a church member one time, in love, don't tell us that we're going to get out early and then not get us out early. I guess that's being guilty of giving people a false hope. We're going to be out of here by 10 of, at least. I believe that with all my heart. I believed it before, and it hasn't come true. Matthew 23, 15 is not my text. And listen, you can amen any time you want to, but you might be amening something that I'll say the opposite on in a couple minutes after that. So I just caution you. By the way, Don Bigelow or his wife, one of the two, got saved under Billy Graham crusade. Sharon Bigelow, great people, solid Christian. Matthew 23, 15, not my text. This is just some introduct introductory comments. I rambled a little at the beginning uh, this morning, so I you know, liked it so much, I'm going to do it again. Matthew 23, uh, 13 through 15, you in Sunday school have heard this about 100 times already. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. 
For you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you them that are entering to go in. Now he starts right out by calling these religious guys hypocrites. This is one of these great verses that depict the love of Christ and his compassion and how tender he is and how all-encompassing he is and how welcoming he is. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, in verse 14, hypocrites. What is popularity? Isn't popularity a lot of people liking you? More or less, is that, I mean, I didn't look it up. When we say he's really popular, don't we mean a lot of people like him? When we talk about the popular vote in the election, we talk about the most, most votes coming in. Now, Jesus was popular with a lot of people, but he was hated by a lot of people. I think he was hated by more people than he was loved. He said, few that be that find it. It's a straight and narrow. It's tough at the gate there, man. It's a narrow way. Few that be broad as a way that leadeth unto destruction. I mean, if they all loved him, wouldn't they all get saved? Haven't Christians been in the minority since day one? Anyway. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense. Why, he's attacking their prayer life. For a pretense, make long prayer. So you're doing it for money. And then he even went further than that and said, therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. Not just damnation, the greater damnation. Well, let's keep going. There's one more good verse we need to hit. We could hit many more. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you come to sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he's made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. He's calling them children of hell. I'm so glad I got rid of those students from a local university that stopped me in the parking lot and said, when you criticize the Jehovah's Witnesses, how are they going to get saved? What am I supposed to do? And by the way, I'm glad nobody's left yet. I started preaching on a Wednesday night one day, and a lady, I can almost remember her last name, I think Mrs. Jeffrey would know her very well, but it goes back, this goes back a lot of years, 25 years. I said a couple things, and she got up and walked out. We were three minutes into the sermon. Okay, so thank you for not uh, leaving. Um, John, lock those back doors, if you would. <laughs> thank you. Don't let anybody out. You're big enough to stop them. So we look at this thing, and I just want you to see that Jesus Christ really didn't cut any corners. Right? He loved people. So how do you know? Well, he died for them. He was crucified, but he did not compromise any doctrine. He didn't figure, well, let's get more people in and knock the rough edges off the gospel. He never did that. Matter of fact, this is pretty rough preaching. I don't know why people don't see that. Maybe they do, but they leave it out of the new versions. I want you to go to Acts chapter 18 if you'd like to. It's still not my text. It's just an introduction. So you don't even have to go there if you don't want to. I'll read it slowly. Acts 18, 14, and 15. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, he's down there in um, Achaia, and he's been brought before the magistrate. And the judge said to the Jews, quote, if it were a matter, matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, Excuse me. <clears throat> Try to, not to let that ruin the sermon for you, if you would. If for a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O you Jews, <clears throat> reason would that I should bear with you. <clears throat> but if it be a question of words and names, if it be a question of words and names, and of your law, look you to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. Words and names. Thank you.
I'm still getting out at 10 off. <sighs> then in Galatians 5.11, I'll read it to you. Paul said, and I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, he did not, by the way, why do I yet suffer persecution? He did. Then is the offense of the cross ceased. There is an offense of the cross. We're going to see that before we're done tonight. And it's about words and names. As I listen to the testimonies at the passing of the man who came to be known as America's pastor, Reverend Billy Graham, I was struck by a phrase that was used several times. It, too, came in the form of a testimony. And I guess slash assume that it was a reference to accepting Christ and being saved. So I heard a phrase repeatedly. And I believe, somewhat correctly at least, that it was a reference to accepting Christ and being saved. And the phrase was this, came to faith. Came to faith. As in, I came to faith under Billy Graham. Or as in, several of my family came to faith under Billy Graham. It is a very nice term. And I feel quite sure that I know what it means. Or at least, I hope I know what it means. But I must say, it's not a faith-specific term. That's my terminology. It's not a faith-specific term. Someone could be said to be of the Jewish faith, correctly. They could be said to be of the Buddhist faith. They could be said to be of the Islamic faith, or Sikhism, or Hinduism, or Confucianism, any of those. So maybe to somebody came to faith means that they became a devout follower of Mohammed, or maybe Buddha. You say, well, you're reaching even coming to faith under Billy Graham, while almost universally means coming to Christ in the biblical sense, includes some controversy as well. For in a widely in uh, critiqued interview with the Reverend Robert Schuller, Billy Graham made the following remarks, and I'm quoting. I think everybody that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, I got a little issue with that terminology. They're members of the body of Christ. And I don't think that we're going to see a great sweeping revival that will turn the whole world to Christ at any time. I think James answered that. The Apostle James in the first council in Jerusalem when he said that God's purpose for this age is to call out a people for his name. And that's what God is doing today. He's calling people out of the world for his name. Whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world, or the Christian world, or the non-believing world, they are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus. But they know in their hearts that they need something that they don't have. And they turn to the only light that they have. I think that they are saved and that they're going to be with us in heaven. I have an issue with some of that. Now, I have all kinds of stuff here. This is from a blobber, uh, I mean a blogger. <laughs> but he's probably telling the truth. But I, you know, I can't, you know, I can't exactly verify it. Now I got some other stuff that I believe was printed, um, I believe by, uh, I believe by my friend. I met him once. I believe this was put out by uh, Chick Tracks. When Billy Graham was on the Phil Donner show, uh, show on 10 11 79, he said that Pope John II was someone that he could quote with some real authority. He also said that the world was looking for a spiritual leader and that the Pope didn't pull any punches. Here is where he got an honorary degree from a Catholic college in 1967. In 1957, Graham said, anyone who makes a decision at our meetings is seen later and referred to a local clergyman, Protestant, Catholic, or Jewish. That's out of the San Francisco News. 
Billy Graham's 1984 Vancouver, British Columbia crusade, the vice chairman of the organizing committee said, quote, if a Catholic steps forward, there will be no attempt to convert them and the names will be given to the Catholic church nearest their homes. Billy Graham even had a priest supervise the 6,600 counselors for the Denver crusade. Information on the hundreds of Catholics who came forward was sent to Catholic organization in Denver. <clears throat> Uh, I do believe, quote from Billy Graham, according to this, I do believe that something happens at the baptism of an infant. We cannot fully understand the mysteries of God, but I believe that a miracle can happen in, in these children so that they are regenerated, that is, made Christian, through infant baptism. That was uh, according to Luther, the Lutheran standard on October of uh, 1967. And on it goes with hellfire thrown out the window and all that other stuff, and how that uh, whatever, whatever uh, guys it was that um, Graham Keith, chairman of the Carolinas Billy Graham uh, Crusade Committee, is quoted in the Charlotte Observer, March 1st, 1996, as saying, we have Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, and other denominations represented on the committee. Our goal is to make it the finest crusade uh, Dr. Graham has ever con uh, conducted. Graham has even gone further, and then it goes on, talks about some other stuff. But uh, they have... Let's see. Mr. Graham believes that we are saved through the blood of Christ. However, the aspect, this aspect of Christian doctrine, he does not emphasize in his messages. This is the duty and prerogative of the pastors. Well, you're sending him back to a Catholic church or a Jewish church. Uh, Graham also gave a boost to the Catholic church in 1952 when he added he hoped to hear Bush, Bishop Fulton J. Sheen at one of the masses at St. Paul's Cathedral tomorrow. Great. 1968, Graham was in a meeting in San Antonio, Texas. He said there, he said that the Roman uh, church had given tremendous cooperation in areas where he had held crusades. He added, quote, a great part of our support today comes from Catholics. We never hold a crusade without priests and nuns being much in evidence in the audience. By 1973, nuns were singing in the choir at Graham's crusades. Well, you get the idea. Let me move on. Let me give you a little bit of Bible in light of what I said. I'm going to quote Acts 4, 10 through 12. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. And by the way, if you've got to do a version of the Bible, which you probably don't, but I could have brought it in. And on the new birth chapter, John chapter 3 and 3.3 uh, 3 and 3.7 particularly, down at the bottom is a footnote. It's evident that our Lord was speaking of baptism, the new birth. You have sacraments in the Catholic Church by which you are saved. One of those is baptism. Somehow you mix them all together, and if you get up past to whatever the, uh, the uh, Mendoza line is, that's a baseball term. Some guy named Mendoza hung in the, Amer in the, uh, national, uh, the, the professional baseball league. I don't know if it was American or national. And he had a very low batting average. I don't know if he was down to 200 or 220 or whatever, but he stayed in the majors. So the people in the majors started calling it the Mendoza line. Because if you fell before that, you were probably below that, you were definitely out. Well, at least I'm above the Mendoza line. Well, Catholic Church, somehow they got a Mendoza line there uh, between a uh, uh, final unction, I guess it is, and infant baptism and church membership and all the other stuff, you know, praying to Mary and all the other things. You put that, mix it in a bag, shake it up. And if you get above the Mendoza line, you don't spend too much time in purgatory. Now, I don't know what I'm going to do for a crusade, how popular I would be, or how many people I could attract. But I'll tell you one thing. I'm not teaching that doctrine if I have a crusade. Nor am I authenticating anybody that does. There is no hope in the Pope. In John 8, 24, the great inclusive Jesus Christ said, I said, therefore, unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. In John 3, 18, he said this, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. 
because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There is an offense to the cross, and all it takes is words and names to bring it to the fore. All I need to do to bring the offense of the cross to the fore is to come in here and mention a few words and names. Talk about being born again. Talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Talk about a glorious new Jerusalem coming down that only Christians are going to go into. Talk about the blood of Christ. That's all I've got to do. Mention a few words and names of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody else. No Muslim. No Koran. Koran. Jewish people need to receive Jesus Christ. Mention a few names and, and words and names and you will have all kinds of things come to the fore very quickly about the offense of the cross. The world recoils at any notion that there is an exclusive nature to heaven or an exclusive word of God. Matter of fact, most of the Bible colleges recoil, recoil at that, by the way. And they recoil at any exclusive, specific Savior who is God in the flesh. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. The Muslim religion teaches that God did not have a son. That's going to put them in opposition with us, isn't it? And if the light you have does not include the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a problem, according to the Bible. 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. How many religions believe that? Well, that and Reverend Moon, probably. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. The word of the times of our days is inclusive. That's our watchword, folks. Inclusive. We must have inclusivity. Inclusivity. Bathrooms, the military, all religions, and all nations must be inclusive. What is inclusivity? It's the fact of policy of not excluding members or participants on the grounds of gender, race, sexuality, class, disability, etc. In other words, to not be inclusive... Or to be inclusive is to make sure that we don't in dis, you know, dismiss anybody, basically on, on the basis of anything. We're inclusive. Can I just say no borders? No borders. That'd be okay. I mean, if we're going to be inclusive, we don't want to have any borders, right? What do we have in churches? We have seeker-sensitive services. We don't want to put up any barriers to anybody coming. Now, we try to be friendly to visitors, don't we? I mean, we pat them on the back, shake hands with them, we're very nice to them. I don't care what religion they are, we're glad to have them here. If I got a Catholic visitor, I'm probably not going to hammer the Catholics like I am right now. You know, just to try to work with them. But I'm not going to compromise with... Um, we got a couple of neighbors that want to get married. And they came by and wanted to get married here. I said, sure, they're in a, one of the victory outreach type things. I don't know if it's victory outreach or not, but they don't have a place to get married. I said, sure, come on down. And um, we were talking, and, and the mother said something about, you know, we're Catholic, but we haven't been going to Catholic church. We're upset about the priest and all that. And I said, well, you know there's no hope in the Pope. Now, that's my way of, you know, getting in tight with Catholics, okay? So there are no borders if you're going to be inclusive. No country borders. We want to be inclusive, no country borders. No heavenly borders. Can't have heavenly borders. I guess we would eliminate the gates and the walls of Revelation 21.12. Revelation 21.12. And had a wall great and high. Sounds like it's not inclusive. They got a great wall. High. And 12 gates. And at the gates, 12 angels. I guess you can't get by one of those, right? You know? Revelation 22, 14 and, 14, uh, 14 and 15. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. 
For without a dogs and sorcerers and on it goes. It's not an inclusive place, folks. Can we just admit that? Do we have to throw around a bunch of baloney so that we can get a good crowd and make everybody feel good? And get people to make a decision for Christ and then send them back to the synagogue where they don't believe in Christ? Or tell them they have to be born again or if we're going to use that term or we're just going to say come to faith? We probably can't say saved. We probably can't say born again. We've got to say came to faith. No gender borders. Can't have any gender borders. Right? Open bathrooms, open locker rooms, open shower rooms. You know, get uh, Obama back in office as soon as possible. No sexual borders. Oh, you puritanical people. Well, oh, what's the matter with you? Come on, get up with a century. What, what's the matter? What? No sexual borders. I don't care whether that's hetero or homo. Either way, no sexual borders. Okay? How many condoms did they get out, give out at the Olympic Village? Have you read anything about that or heard anything about that? They're handing out thousands of condoms to the, the athletes at the village. I don't think they're all married. Really, they're just meeting new people and getting along. Everything's inclusive. No morality borders. Everything is inclusive. And anything that is exclusive is unacceptable to the one world system over which the Antichrist will soon rule. During which he will dupe millions into a hellish lake of fire for all eternity. Which, by the way, is very, very exclusive. Only certain people can get in and nobody can get out. What about Luke 16? Those who would pass from here to there can't. Amen? Can't do it. Separated. And everything, by the way, is very exclusive and non-forgiving. And everything that is done to water down the Bible to provide any alternative way to heaven, let's not forget John 14, 6, which clearly states, by Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What do we do with that? What in the world is any evangelist going to do with that if they're going to preach, okay, Mohammed's fine. The Jewish faith is fine. Wait a minute. They reject the guy, God Almighty in the flesh, who said, nobody's going to get to the Father but by me. How do you skip by that? Well, you can if you want to, but I'm not. Or in any way to indicate that any person may be in any way a substitute for the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody that does that is playing exactly into the hands of the devil. And we might, we might mention Romans 1.16, where it is written, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, God wrote it, Paul's the author, if you will, the human author, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. At the essence of this whole satanic process is the rejection of the clear statements of the word of God. And this, I believe, is because, number one, some are ashamed of the clear truth of the gospel. Now, let's think about that for a minute. They say, well, I believe it, but man, I just can't preach that in a group. Okay? We're ashamed of it. The Bible, Jesus talks about hell all the time. That's, that's a hyperbole. He doesn't talk about it all the time, but a lot of the time. Okay? And if we can't get a grip on that, then we're ashamed of it. Say, I'm uncomfortable with that, so I'm going to stay away from it. Then you're ashamed of that part of the gospel. If we can't preach Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, then you're ashamed of that part of the gospel. So things that kind of don't sit well with us, when we try to skip by them, we're sitting in judgment of the word of God and what Jesus said. We are now not a messenger. We're now the interpreter of it. We're now the originator of it, if you will. We're not preaching Christ's message anymore. We're taking Christ's message. We're editing it, correcting it as we see fit, and then preaching it. I say that's not good. 
And that, at that point, you're ashamed of the clear truth of the gospel. Then, of course, some are offended at the exclusive nature of Christ, who is absolutely one of a kind. There is none like him. There's nobody else in human history, neither could there be, like the Lord Jesus Christ. So whoever you've got, whether it's Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or whoever else you've got, there's nobody like the Lord Jesus Christ. The Jehovah's Witnesses have nothing to compare to him because he's God Almighty. They've got to change the doctrine of Jesus Christ. He said he was God in the flesh. He's the Messiah. I speak unto thee and he. Under the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God. God the Father calls God the Son, God. So, some are offended at the exclusive nature of Christ, who is absolutely one of a kind. And that leads us to the inescapable conclusion that they're ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now, the concluding verse to this little tirade has to be Mark 8.38, and I'm going to ask you to turn to it. Mark 8.38. And by the way, I think I've mentioned here recently, maybe halfway often, that I think Billy Graham had just a wonderful voice and a wonderful presentation. He could preach. I never found anything wrong with his sermons. I love listening to Billy Graham. Okay? Just want to say that, by the way. Mark 8.38. Whosoever, therefore, shall be ashamed of me and of my words. Of me and my words. Well, preacher, we really don't have his word. Okay, that's their answer. That's a transcriber's error. That's a mistake in the Bible. Well, the Bible's not perfectly true. You know, there are mistakes in the Bible, and, and we have the essence of what he said, but you can't go to the Bible and just grab this stuff out. No, that's what's taught. Whosoever there shall be ashamed of me and of my words. In this adulterous and sinful generation. Okay, church, we're in it. We're in the adulterous and sinful generation. Sports builds character, folks. So they hand out thousands of condoms to some of the finest athletes in the world that have all come together for a specific purpose. It's an adulterous and sinful generation. Continuing on. Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed. This is on an individual basis. Catholic doctrine stinks. I never said every Catholic was going to hell. There's possibly some people in the Catholic Church that are saved in spite of the doctrine, which I believe there are. Of him also, it's on an individual basis, shall the Son of Man be ashamed. Hmm. You mean Jesus is going to be ashamed of some people? When he cometh. You know, I'd like to hear that song by Pastor Smith and Rod and all those others. They could sing it again. It won't be Harry Krishna sitting on the judgment throne. Yeah. Amen? No, it's the Lord Jesus Christ that's coming back. Nobody else. You cannot fill in the blank on that one. He's coming back, and if you're not right with him, he's going to be ashamed of you. And he's coming in the glory of his Father. When he cometh in the glory of his father. It's his father. Now we're adopted into the family. I understand. God is our father. But there's only one person that was ever in the flesh that could make that statement. There is nobody else. There can't be anybody else. And anything else that's preached or allowed is unbiblical. With the holy angels. Words and names are the essence of the offense of the gospel. Words and names are the essence of the offense of the gospel. Because those words and names define who we are. They define us. What defines me? Uh, Donnie taught slash preached this morning about what were those two questions you could ask? What matters to you and what are you doing? Something like that. Who do you love and what do you love to do? Well, that defines us. We love Jesus, and we love to serve Jesus. 
That was the answer to his questions. Now, we love other people, too. We don't only love Jesus because he's commanded us not to do that. We're to love our neighbors, we're to love our wives, we're to love a lot of people. But we don't ever displace Jesus. Amen? But words and names of the offense are the essence of the offense, and those words and names define us. What defines me? The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Those were believers. They got saved. There was a revival in Antioch. They got saved, and they became known as Christians. Why? Because they were following Christ. And like we said this morning, if you're going to follow Christ, that means you're not taking your own path. If I'm going to follow Nick, I'm going where he goes. And I said, well, I'd like to go here, but I'm following Nick, so I'm going here. Amen. And I, I don't say that of myself. I say that of Donnie because he said sometimes he gets off in the flesh. <laughs> Amen? But there are probably some times that the flesh tries to dictate to us. Yeah. Not probably. There <laughs> absolutely are. Right. When the flesh says to do one thing and the spirit says to do something else. Buddy Franklin said they were like two dogs, the spirit and the flesh, and whichever one you said sick him to, that's the one that went. And if you say sick him to the flesh, you're going to go off in the flesh. If you say sick him to the spirit, have you heard that terminology before? That probably was repeated in the Baptist Bible Fellowship for 50 years before I got saved. But uh, I heard that a lot of times out of Buddy. You probably heard it too, Pastor. But uh, that's what we used to say. And there's a lot of truth in it. So what are we going to do? Are we following Christ? Are we following our own desires? Those words and names define who we are. I'm a Christian. That defines me. I believe in the new birth. <coughs> I believe the King James Version of the Scriptures is being perfectly accurate, without error. That defines me. Oh, that lady and uh, girl, woman, young lady. You know, when I got upset one day in a Bible class and took my textbook and threw it down on the floor, fortunately... I was already on staff at the college, and I was a good friend of uh, Mr. Smith, who was the, um, not that Mr. Smith, another Smith. There was, um, everybody's name was Smith until I sinned, and then God changed their name. <laughs> so, isn't that right, Pastor? That was one of his doctrines. Um, anyway, Smith was a baseball coach, and I worked with him in the sports. He was assistant basketball coach, and, you know, he'd already promised me an A-plus in the uh, in the class. And I didn't like the textbook. I probably still got it in my office, had a bunch of criticisms of the King James. I took it and threw it down on the floor and said, why we get this junk for a textbook? And some girl said to me, she said, well, I suppose you're a King James man. I mean, it defines us. It tells who we are. Words and names define us. I'm a Christian. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the shed blood, the resurrection. And I loved it when, brother, uh, brother, I think he's saved, George Bush. I don't think he's quite as good a president as Donald Trump is, but I believe he's a saved man. He's probably more saved than Donald Trump is, but I'm not sure. <laughs> but listen, he, when he gave his testimony, we heard it on TV, and we loved it. And he talked, he didn't say came to faith. He might have included that. But he said came to faith in the resurrected Christ. Let me tell you, there's no doubt about that statement when you make that. You don't confuse that with a Muslim. Came to faith in the resurrected Christ. I love it. I know which name I stand on. And I know whose words I totally embrace. And I have no room whatsoever. After all, the Bible says neither give place to the devil in Ephesians 4.27. I have no room <coughs> for anything or anyone else in terms of my Lord and Savior. And I'm not apologizing for being exclusive on that. The Mass has ended. Go in peace. <laughs> Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you. We're so blessed. I ought to reflect upon it often. We're so blessed to have this word of God. I don't have to go to any evangelist to get my authority. 
I don't have to pass any college course to get my authority. I don't need anybody's approval to get my authority on where I stand on salvation. And it's on the solid rock and nowhere else. And that rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful for it. And I don't believe we're to compromise with anybody. I don't believe we're to water down the gospel whatsoever. I don't believe we're to apologize. The Lord Jesus Christ was extremely caustic in his preaching. I'm not Jesus. None of us are. But he did not soften the gospel. He told people that him that cometh unto me, I'll no wise cast out. He really opened the door wide open and he was the door, said I'm the door. But he did not compromise that there was another door. He never did that. And God is faithful preachers of the word of God, every one of us here. Help us never to compromise on the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and not to apologize for it. And it's not for us to feel bad about it. God gave us the gospel. He authored it. He is the author. We have no reason to apologize or feel bad for it. All we have to do is love our brothers, love the world in Christ's stead, and by all means, give them the truth, which Jesus said would set you free. Preaching a false gospel will never set you free. Preaching a false gospel will never do anybody any good. It's the truth that will set us free. God, I thank you that you've revealed it to us. God, never know if there's somebody here that's not received Christ as their own personal Lord and Savior exclusively. Might tonight be the night that they would receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And God, I'm so thankful for that evening service. And it was an evening service. When I threw the old hymn book down in the pew and said, I'm going to receive Christ. Thank you for that. Give you all the glory, all the credit. I accept none of that. No credit. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.